Welcome to the Faith Assembly live stream. Our goal here at Faith is to help you connect, grow, and go. We want to help you connect to active faith, grow in that faith by providing opportunities to do so, and then to go and live out the Great Commission. Our prayer is that as you join us in this time of worship and study in the Word, that you will be encouraged and you too would connect, grow, and go. Thanks for joining us and we hope you enjoy the service.
hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. All of the ground is sinking sand.
we stop in the middle of our busy lives to take a look around us and be in awe of his creation? How often do we stop and are in awe of the things that he not only does in our life, but the things that we don't even see that's going on, the protection that he provides? I think too often we use the word awe and awesome and too flippant of a manner. Everything nowadays is awesome. That TV show is awesome. You know, the sports team is awesome. We use that word so much, and I believe it's lost its meaning. And when we're saying that God is awesome, we're saying that everything about who He is makes me stand in awe. It makes me take a, take a second. It makes me take a breath and say, oh my goodness. Everything about you brings me to awe. We, all we have to do is look around us. All we have to look, do is look at ourselves. Look at how he created us. I mean, if the fact that our bodies, when broken, automatically begin to heal themselves and that the cells begin to target the area of infection or the area of the wound and begin to work over time to bring healing to our bodies, that is quite literally God's hand at work. That is quite literally his healing working inside of us because he created every cell of our being. This morning, we're going to sing this a few more times. And I want us to truly focus in on who God is. Not only what he's done, but who God is. And that the fact that he is awesome. And if, if, if our mindset of God does not bring us to all, then I want us to ask us this morning, God, reveal something about yourself that I haven't seen before. Show me something in your word. Show me something in my spirit this morning that brings me to my knees in awe of who you are. Because our God is truly awesome. Amen. Come on, let's lift our hands and sing this.
we are here in this atmosphere of worship, I want to invite the ushers to come down. You know, sometimes and oftentimes we separate our worship time in here and our offering time as if it's two separate things. But you know, God has taught us in His Word that part of our worship is our giving. Giving of our tithes and of our money is just one aspect of worship. Giving of our time is another aspect of our worship. Giving of our song and our voices and our body is even yet another aspect of worship. And this morning, I want to I want to take this opportunity to allow you to worship God through your tithes and giving. But this morning as you give, I want to ask you, as you put your money in the offering, not to just do it uh, out of obligation or in routine because it's what we do, because of what's what we do every week. But as you give, I want you to think of something that God either has done in your life or something that He is to you. And as we talked about a little bit ago of how God is awesome, as you give this morning, I want you to give with a cheerful heart and say, God, you know what? You have provided for me. I have a roof over my head. I have clothes on my body. I'm going to go home after church today and eat food. You have provided that for me. And this morning, I give a little bit back to you in thanksgiving. I give a little bit back to you to give you thanks for what you've done for me and all of your provisions for me. God, I pray this morning, Lord, as we give, God, that we would give to you with a cheerful heart. God, that we would give to you not out of obligation, God, not to mark it off of a checklist, God, but to give to you with a cheerful heart because you first gave to us. God, and you continually give to us on a daily basis. Lord, bless the offering and bless the gift. Welcome to Faith Assembly. Thanks for joining us. If you're a first time guest, we want to ask you to grab a connection card from the seat in front of you. If you will fill that out front and back and take it to our guest connections table, we have a gift for you. Welcome home. If you're interested in being a member here at Faith, our next step classes will be beginning on Sunday, August 12th at 9.30 a.m. in the conference room. If you're interested in being a part of this class, you can sign up at faith-assembly.org. If you have the gift of hospitality, and would like to help our new guests and regular attenders feel welcome as they come on to the Faith Assembly campus on Sunday mornings. We would love to have you join the First Impressions team. 
Your smiling face and warm handshake are all that's required for the, in this vital ministry. If you've been here one month or 30 years, please consider serving one or two Sundays a month. For more information, please see either of us at the new guest table in the foyer after service. If you're new here and want to learn more about life at faith, please join us for Pizza with the Pastors on Sunday, August 5th, immediately following the service. I tell you, it is wonderful to be able to come into a place like this, into a nice facility with wonderful people, friends, family in Christ, and just worship together. You know, there's a lot of, a lot of nations and a lot of people in this world that don't have that opportunity, and I'm just so blessed, and I, I just, I was sitting over there thinking as we were singing and, and um, worshiping God that, you know, not everyone, A, at this point in time, has that opportunity. Not everyone has the privilege and the freedom to do that. And throughout history, not everyone has had that. And so I am so thankful that I get to come along with you guys every week and to just worship our Heavenly Father and Savior. Let's just give God one more hand clap of praise because of how good He is. Amen. Well, this morning, as you can tell, I am not Pastor Steve. So um, we, uh, we, our team is actually uh, off to fine arts. Pastor Steve, Pastor Lisa, as well as our fine arts team, uh, and a few others have, have gone to Houston, Texas, and had the wonderful opportunity to minister in Houston. Um, so we miss them, but we are also praying for them that God would not only give them safe travels and a wonderful time there, but that they would be able to minister to people and, and that they would, um, through something they did, through something they sung, sang uh, or sing and say, that, that people's lives would be touched uh, through their ministry. I did want to make one other note. Uh, it wasn't on our announcement video. But um, this week, this past week, we had VBS. And I don't know if any of you uh, that, that were here were involved, but it was amazing. If you were involved in VBS helping at any point in time this week, either be it set up or during the week, I just want you to stand real quick. I want us to give these guys, as well as Pastor Glenn uh, uh, and all of the other helpers that aren't here, a hand of, of, of thanks um, and appreciation. Wow. I tell you, it was wonderful. There was a moment at the, on Friday night that I saw, and I promise you I'm not preaching. We have someone else for that today. But <laughs> there was a moment on Friday night at the end when everything was wrapping up that Pastor Glenn gave an altar call. And there were kids ages, um, I want to say probably five or six all the way up through um, 12, 12-ish, 12 uh, up here at the altar, on their knees, on their faces, praying and just going before God. And, you know, Oftentimes I've seen in, in kids' church and stuff, or, or just with kids, that they'll, they'll say, well, dear God, bless this, bless that. But these kids were going after God. And even to the point where when Pastor Glenn was, you know, okay, we've done what we've got to do, they were staying here and just praying. And guys, that's what it's about. It's about pouring into our next generation. And so I'm sure you'll see in the weeks to come some, uh, some highlights from VBS, but I did want to make mention that uh, we had a wonderful time, and thank all of you that, that were involved in that. Well, today, as I mentioned, Pastor Steve is not here, but we have a special treat and a special guest. We have someone that I like to call a friend and someone who, who is, is home to hear. He, they have been missionaries for over 30 years, I believe. We were talking earlier. I began to ask him where all they had been missionaries to, and he started listing so many, I'm not even going to try. Um, but I want to welcome my good friend, Jerry Jacob. Uh, to the platform to bring the word this morning. Let's give him a hand clap of praise, uh, of thanksgiving and appreciation. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. I am not Pastor Steve, as you can tell by the hair. That's about it. <laughs> Thank you, Trey. We've uh, first time we were at their church was, I think you, Karen was saying maybe about seven or eight years. You were about seven or eight years of age at that time, a long time ago. But first of all, I'd like to say thank you to the worship team. We, m many times we don't think about them, but boy, they talk about time and effort. Let's just give them a, a round of applause. They've done a great job. Um, we love this church. Thank you, Mom my mother-in-law, and um, my dad, his father-in-law, who passed away a few years ago, a number of years ago, at, when he was attending the church in Hooker, um, at, was it Ch Hooker Street, Hooker Avenue, that's in Greenville here, I know that, but um, 
first time we visited the church was in 1988 when we were coming back from in between uh, jobs in, in, in uh, Guam. And that was the first time we visited the church. And then uh, when we, before we received our full uh, commitment, as full assignment as uh, missionaries in 1989, we were here, we attended the church for about four or five months before receiving our appointment and started church hopping, which is allowed in the Assemblies of God if you're a missionary. I'm not going to say anything else (laughs) on that. But um, we spent... uh, close to four or five months at the, at the church. And since that time, I was thinking, this is the longest. We've been here four, four weeks, I think, four Sundays, and that's the longest we've been at this church since 1989. Uh, before that, overseas, many years, when we come back, we would raise our support. And we thank this church. I appreciate Pastor Steve when he was talking last Sunday about mission and missions. Um, this church has been very, very important in our lives, and there are people here that do have supported us individually, but I think since 1990, um, this church has supported us, and, and we thank this church. Thank you for supporting missionaries. Thank you. And we spent most of our time in a very tough place, the Pacific Islands. There, and it's not Hawaii. <laughs> Passed through many times. But um, the people that we saw, the people that we ministered to, um, thank you for the many churches that were planted, for kids that were saved, adults delivered from demonic spirits. Thank you. Thank you for your support. And we're not done. None of us are done until we pass on or when Jesus comes back and we can all do rapture practice right now, okay? Learned that from a pastor, missionary pastor in Guam in 1986, Pastor John Burt. Okay, church, everybody stand. We're going to do rapture practice. (laughs) But we always came back down. But one of these days we won't. Hallelujah. (laughs) But we are still... um, fully appointed missionaries, and the Lord has blessed us in these last waning years. Don't feel waning, but um, sometimes my body feels it, but we're up at North Point Bible College. It used to be by uh, Zion Bible Institute in um, Providence, Rhode Island. They've moved since then, moved up north of Boston, right on the New Hampshire border, and we're teaching missions classes to those students. It's an Assembly of God school. It's one of the few schools that is still totally involved in ministry, pastoral, missionary, Sunday school teachers, youth pastors, children's pastors, and worship. And so we're we're pouring our our experience, and I like sometimes like to call those those mush-headed kids, just soaking it in. And so thank you. Pray for us as we'll be leaving. Uh, We won't be back here next Sunday. We'll be up there and and uh, continuing our, our work there as, as far as teaching. And we just love it. And it's God's will for this time, in our, at this time. So we thank you, thank you, thank you. If you would have your Bibles, I'd ask you to turn to Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. If you have your hymnal or your, your Bible, Bible in, your, in, the, in the hymn book area, it's page 151. I checked that before. I just don't have a tele- You know, I just che- made sure I checked that or your phone or app or whatever, and I'm sure it'll be on the screen. But I'm going to be reading a couple of scriptures, those scriptures at different parts during my sermon, but I just want to give a brief history of uh, just what was going on at that time. Uh, but the book of Joshua is a series of lessons for each one of us, and it's a story of Joshua's leadership in moving the Israelite people from wandering in the wilderness but into the promised land. And from the choices and decisions that they, they made to possess God's promises, we, you and I can take some really valuable lessons from those, from those things that they, that they experienced. These are just not some general words of encouragement for the Christian life, but there are some very, very specific challenges for us as we work out the implication of God's salvation in each of our lives. And so beginning in verse number 1 and 2, It says, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, 
The Lord said to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' aid, Moses, my servant is dead. Now then, you and all of these people, get ready. Get ready. It's an important script, important couple words. Get ready to cross the Jordan River into the land. I am about to give you to them, to the Israelites. How do we possess his promise? It's a question I will ask several times during this sermon. How do we possess his promise? First of all, we need to look to the future. In that scripture reading that we just read, the first sentence, it says, Moses is dead. Wow, what an encouraging word. Moses is dead. Now we know that Joshua had served the Israelites and Moses as vice president for 40 years. He was accustomed to taking orders and implementing the vision of Moses, but 40 years of history is now suddenly over. The partnership that had worked so well for so long is finished. At that moment when Joshua was given the command or given that commission, he could have become paralyzed, full of grief and uncertainty by wishing for the return to the time when someone else was carrying the burden in leading the Israelites. But God shocks him into reality and action with a stark and bold declaration, Moses is dead, now get ready. My question to you this morning is, which direction are you facing in life? Yesterday or tomorrow? It's a key question for those of us that want to possess the promise. You know, yesterday holds on to a lot of us. Sometimes with wonderful memories, pleasurable moments that we want to relive and relive and relive again. And sometimes there are powerful regrets or terrible pains that we want, often try to fix over and over again in our minds. But the victories and the defeats of yesterday are history, church. We learn from them, but we are foolish to try to relive them. Some of us are dealing with things that have happened years ago, hurtful words or actions that cause us hurt, and we have held on to them for years. But if we cannot give them and those things to the Lord, if we cannot lay them at his feet, we will never find total release and peace that the Lord so much wants us to have. We have a, we've had a close friend, and his, um, his their husband and wife, they were married in our home church up in New Jersey, Mike and Mary Mahoney. And Mary, uh, was, she was a wild child, pre-salvation. And when they got saved, they really got involved in the church. And I can remember, in fact, Mary, Mary even babysat, I, at least her kids, several. I don't know if Heather was um, even old enough to be babysat by her, they, I don't know, she wasn't even born at that time, but, but she would babysit her two boys. But every, every so often she would come back up to the altar during an altar call at the end of the service, and she would just weep and cry, and I know my wife would go down and talk with her about, and just, just try to minister to her, but there were things that in her past that even though she had gotten saved, those things, and that was actually an attack of the enemy, I, I believe that with all my heart, that she just couldn't get over. She would come to the altar, lay them at his feet, but then carry them back home with her. And it was, it was many times, year and year and year after year, and finally, after some time, they left the church and were moved, and I remember getting a word back from, through a letter that she had had a nervous breakdown for some time, and it was because of some of these issues, praise the Lord, she was finally able to give that to the Lord. She laid it at the feet of the Lord, and she did not pick those things up again. But so many of us, we come and we try to lay those things at the altar, but yet we tend to pick those things back up again, and we're in no better shape than when we first came down. We have to remember, we must live for the future. Jesus saved us. He's forgiven us. He doesn't remember those things, and we should walk away free, giving God the glory for it. Yesterday is gone. Jesus put the necessity of facing the future in a wonderful word picture 
that makes it pretty clear in Luke chapter 9, verses 60 and 62. Some of you are farmers, you know what I'm talking about. Let those who are spiritually dead care for their own dead. Your duty is to go and preach the coming of the kingdom of God, and that's all of us, not just talking about pastors or missionaries, but all of us preaching the gospel, whatever that means, our life preaches. Whatever we're doing, wherever we're at, our life preaches the kingdom of God. Anyone who puts a hand to the plow and then looks back is not fit for the kingdom of God. Wow, that's pretty tough to look back on those things that we did in the past. My grandfather, my mom's mom, my mom's dad, excuse me, um, was a farmer out in uh, Ohio, and he had about 100 acres. And I remember a couple years when we were kids, my dad was a pastor in a church, and he, would be moved, he was moved from different churches at different times because in that denomination, every three years, you were moved. And so we lived close to my, my grandfather and grandmother who lived on a farm, and he had about 100 acres. And I remember one spring during a, during a school break, um, we went out to the farm, and he was getting ready to plow a field that had been barren all winter long and it had been flattened down and he had about as I said he was going to plow it and, and uh, plow it for corn and so he sat me up on the the John Deere tractor in the middle it was between his legs and he had all the shifters and stuff and he would drive and my, he, I was um, straddled by him and we would get to the middle of the field he always started at the middle and I said grandpa how do you keep a straight line and he said, I always look at one tree that's been there for many, many years, and I look at that tree that's way down. In fact, it wasn't even on the property. It was across the dirt road in those days, and there was another field beyond it. But he says, I keep my eyes on that tree. I don't look back, and I aim for that tree, and then I start my first line. And once you have that first line in, you've got it, a straight line. Boy, what a picture our own lives. Do not look back. Do not try to relive those things of the past. Learn from them and move on to the future. Verses 3 and 4. I will give you every place where you set your foot as I promised Moses. That's a, that's a powerful word right there. Where you plant your feet, claim it for the Lord. Where you live in that community, where you are at that, per, that place, at work, I'm claiming this territory for the Lord. Where you set your feet, as I promised Moses, your territory will extend from the desert to Lebanon and from the great river of the Euphrates, all the Hittite country to the great sea on the west. How do we possess his promise? Define the promise. Got to, we've got to understand the promise. Joshua had a specific promise, a clear vision to guide his every effort. Cross into the land, march through it, taking what I have already given to you. What a promise. Joshua never called for a vote or retreat again. We know that from Scripture. He knew what God's promise was, and he was determined to live in that promise. He had seen firsthand the result of being wishy-washy, double-minded about God's directions 40 years before. Remember, he was one of the 12 spies that were, sent, that were sent into Canaan to check out in preparation for conquest. And when he returned, he and his friend Caleb gave a glowing report of the land that they had thought that they were going to conquer and go into just in the next few weeks or the next few months. But we know that there were other spies that said, boy, this land looks great, but. How many times do we say that? I think I can do it. I know I can do it, but. I'm going to say it. My wife is squinting. Sometimes we have a but problem. B-U-T. You're never going to get this. I guarantee it. But sometimes we do. I'm going to do this for the Lord. I want to do that for the Lord, but. And, of course, they proceeded to magnify the problem. 
focus on the difficulties, minimize God's promise, say, oh, it, it really isn't going to happen. They had no faith. And the result, the Israelites wandered around in the Sinai wilderness for another 40 years while the whole generation died off and were buried in a desert that they chose over God and these promises. Sad. Don't let that but cause you to lose the promises that he's given you. To possess the promise of God, define his will, and then we need to own it. How can we know God's will? I can remember as a kid, um, my dad was not a pastor in, uh, in a Pentecostal church, evangelical church, but I remember going to camps, and they would always talk about God's will. How many of you remember that? As if you were in camps and stuff as a young kid. God's will. And I tell you what, they never really explained God's will. But it was some magical thing out there. God's will. And I, for some reason, I always thought it had to be in ministry. It's just the way it was in those days. And, and it wasn't until later, a long time later, that I realized where I was planted was God's will at that time. And I tell you what, church, where we are planted, where you are at this time in your life, that is God's will for you if you are in Jesus Christ. We get so hung up on that, and our kids get hung up on that. God's will. If I'm not in ministry, I must not be in God's will. Baloney. That's a northern word for whatever it is. Scrapple? I don't know. Chitlins? Chitlins! I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. But um, come on, people. We, we are in God's will where we are planted. Amen? We are. We are five building components to live by. One, have a solid working knowledge of the Scripture. Know who God is, how God works. That only comes through reading the Word. His will for all people is spelled out in the stories and the teachings of the Bible. God's will. Have a solid working knowledge of the Scripture. Secondly, a life that includes prayer. Prayer is simply conversing with God. So talk with God. In your own words, discussing the issues of life. Of course, a mature Christian prayer life is needed, but one never learns how to pray well if they don't start praying at all. Even if it's done poorly. Childlike, faithful prayer. You think we got to have all the words and go for about 10 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes or whatever and say the right things. Just pray. Notice, though, that prayer is conversing with God also. We have to listen sometimes. Sometimes we do all the talking. I think it's important we must meditate, keep quiet, and listen. We were teaching a class, um, Missio Day class, the mission of God, to a, bunch of a whole group of freshmen this past semester, and we got to the point where part of that mission of God is prayer, and meditation, and what does meditation mean? Boy, it's hard for us Americans to meditate. <laughs> I'm preaching to myself, Mom. <laughs> we get busy, 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 and meditate. And we, and uh, we saw a video, we had found a video of a gal that was just teaching meditation, just say, read a scripture. Read one scripture and meditate on one word that comes to your heart. Read it again, meditate more. Read again, meditate more. And if we learn that practice, God will start speaking to us about maybe one particular word in that scripture. But we need to sit down and be quiet and listen and meditate. A life that includes prayer is also part of the will of God. Thirdly, the counsel of wise and godly friends, the myth of a superhero does not exist in our Christian life. God will sharpen us as we share life with others and that we are truly authentic or real. How many of us have said this morning, Hey, how are you? And we've said back, oh, everything's okay. Is it really? 
but we're so conditioned. Hey, it's okay, but down, down inside, stuff is really going on. We're supposed to be a community of believers. And a Bible, the Word tells us that we are to share our burdens, one with another, our fears, our doubts, our struggles, and our victories. There is wise counsel in doing that. God put those words in the Scripture, and we need to share that. Not blab it. Not talk about it with other people unless you're given permission, but to share our burdens, wise counsel with other Christians. Be amazed at the people that you, that you talk with in this community right here of believers that have, might have gone through some of the same struggles that you're going through now and what wise counsel they can give you. Tremendously wise counsel. Fourthly, knowing the will of God in the circumstances of life. God is ruling the affairs of our life if we are following him. He is perfectly capable of orchestrating situations to create a place where his will and your life intersect. You and I cannot ignore what God wants to do in our lives. He closes doors. He will open doors, and we must be aware of it. Sometimes, though, God will say no. If we're not in tune with God, listening to his directives, we can cause problems for ourselves and those around us. Karen and I have uh, are live by closed doors and open doors through our, for our life in ministry. Thinking we were going to China, the door closed. We ended up in the Marshall Islands. Thinking we were going to be ever forever in the Solomon Islands, the door closed. We ended up in Fiji. And on and on. God will provide. If he closes a door, there will be a door that will open. We just need to seek and take time, meditate and be prepared to walk through that door. And when we walk through, wow, we're in the right place. Sometimes we try to break those doors down, try to create the, our own door, and it can cause a lot of difficulties. So circumstances. Then fifthly, your desires. If you have surrendered a heart to God, your God, and has, he has given you a new life, then take note of your desires. Some say, if I listen to God's will, I'm going to be miserable. No, you won't. Listen, he shaped you and me, prepared us for these experiences, given us our skills and our abilities, and we all have different skills and abilities. He knows the desires of your heart, and when we are in tune with him and do what he wants us to do, it his way, we will, in the busyness of life and all that, bring, and all that brings, even in the exhaustion of the battles and the waiting and traffic here in this crazy city that's getting busier and busier, we can truly say, this is why I was created, to do his will, and I'm going to rest in peace while I'm doing his will. We've got to take those things under, under advisement. Let's continue. Read verse number 5. No one will be able to stand up against you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. Did you hear that, church? He's never going to leave us. He's never going to forget, forsake us. If we're in his will. How do we possess his promise? Stay in his powerful presence. Obedience is foundational to enjoying the presence of God. If you are openly rebellious against him, the spirit will withdraw his peace and his comfort from you. If you resist the conviction of the word, you will grow distant, distant from God's presence. If you nurture and develop ungodly attitudes, a pride for unforgiveness, greed, or sensuality, God's spirit will not be with you or any of us. God encouraged Joshua to be strong and courageous. God was asking for every bit of strength Joshua had and even more. There's no way that Joshua could do it alone, and he understood that. And our skills, we cannot do it alone. We cannot do this alone. Take a look at the explanation God gives to Joshua about living his powerful presence, and let's finish up the reading, and I'll ask the worship team to come up. In verse number 6, 
Be strong and courageous. Say that to each other. Be strong and courageous. Because you will lead these people to inherit the land I swore to their forefathers to give them. Be strong and very courageous. Say that. Be strong and very courageous. Be careful to obey all the law my servant Moses gave you. Do not turn from it from the right or to the left, that you may be successful in where, whenever you go or wherever you go. Do not let this book of the law depart from you or your mouth meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will prosper and be successful. Have I not commanded you, be strong and courageous. Do not be terrified. Do not be discouraged. For the Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. Wow, powerful promise. Powerful promise. Powerful peace is found in the presence of God. Powerful peace is found in the presence of God. His spirit produces serenity. His spirit produces peacefulness that allows us to rise above the situations that cause others to panic and to be filled with fear, which will cause defeat. Now, listen, God was not inviting Moses, or excuse me, God was not inviting Joshua to a t nice retirement community on the Mediterranean Sea. He wasn't offering Joshua a rocking chair and say, sit back and relax. Don't worry. Be happy. He wasn't offering that. God was handing Joshua a commission in his army, a challenge to possess the promised land and build a new nation. And talk about a wacky group of people, as we know from Moses' day and age. And aren't we much like them? Rebellious, cantankerous, not happy all the time. But yet we need to be in his presence. His will is the same for you and me, folks. To engage life, his will is not for us to detach or separate ourselves from reality. We've often said you can go to one of those small little islands out in the Pacific where it's just a coconut tree, and before you know it, you're going to be arguing with the coconut tree and the coconuts. You'll get bored. You'll get upset. You'll get angry. We cannot detach ourselves from humanity. He doesn't, doesn't want us away, run us, he doesn't want us to run away from life or escape into denial. He wants you and me to be fully engaged in life where we are at, bringing order to chaos, bringing healing to the broken, resisting evil wherever it shows its ugly face. In the spiritual war warfare of this Christian life, Christian, he wants us to be people who live in his peaceful presence. Do you want to possess God's promise? If you do, you and I must embrace Christ as Lord and Savior by faith. That's the entry point into this grace. Then these other parts which include look to the future, don't look back. Define the promise and the purpose of God living in His will. Staying obediently where you are can lead you into that powerful and peaceful presence of God. Amen? Amen? Heavenly Father, thank you. Thank you so much for your word and the example of Joshua becoming the new commander of this huge population of cantankerous people. But God, you gave him peace. He didn't look to the past and wish it was back then in those days with Moses. He looked to the future. He was bold and courageous, taking upon your promise of where I place my feet, I will be there with you. And he was purposed to do everything he could and then letting God make up the difference. Thank you for his life and being obedient to, to you, Lord. Thank you. And I pray that if there are those here that are struggling with stuff, looking in the past, Lord, that you will deliver them the stuff of the past. 
God, you said you can deliver us. We must just be yielded and obey and leave it at your feet. Keep it there at the feet of Jesus and then walking away and never looking back. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. As we close this service, these altars are open. I know that there will be a prayer team that's here. If you want to pray uh, silently, these altars are open. If the Lord has spoken to you and you feel that the Lord just that you just need to get some time with the Lord, as again I said, these altars are open. We will be here. But I truly pray that you will possess everything that God has given you. Take, take this example of Joshua and these words, be strong and courageous, planting your feet. God, you are going to be there with me through the highs and the lows. And he and you, please know that you are in God's will wherever you were planted and live Christ to those people around you. God, we bless you. Amen. Jerry had mentioned, we just want to invite you to come down. And if in your life you, um, you're at a place where you need to say, I, I need to stop looking back. I need to look forward at all that God has for me. I want to invite you uh, once again to just come down. We're going to sing a few, uh, a song a few times. I just want to encourage you to just come down and say, God, you know what? I've been carrying this. I've been carrying uh, maybe past regrets, maybe past hurts with me my whole life. Today is the day that I'm going to release that to you because I'm more interested in my future with you than I am in the past that I had before you, man. So would you just come and let's just worship. I give myself away. I give myself away so you. So 
myself away. I'll make that your prayer this morning. I give myself away so you can use me. Give myself begin to show us what your plan is and what your will is for our life. God, and as we've heard this morning, to just rest assured that where you have us is where you want us. God, and I pray that you would confirm that with a peace in each and every one of us. God, I pray that you would continue to lead and guide us. God, and I pray that our heart's prayer is that it's not about me, and it's not about us, but about you. And so we are willing to give you every part of who we are so that you can use us to the fullest potential, God. We know you have so much for us. God, we know you have so much for every individual in this place. God, and we just ask you to use us. Help us to stop focusing on our past and rest assured in our future with you and everything that you have for us on this, and on this earth and in eternity, God. We thank you, Lord. I pray as we go out of this place this morning, you would be with each and every one of us. God, lead and guide us, direct us. God, show us the opportunities you have for us. Let us not pass anyone by that you have placed in our path, God, so that we can share your love. Be with us. Go before us. Protect us. Bring us back together next week, Lord. God, and I pray that there would be things that happen in our lives and our church this week that we could truly stand and say, Lord, nothing has been impossible for you. Thank you for our time together this morning. We give ourselves to you and ask that you use us. In your heavenly name we pray, amen. As we sing this a couple more times, you're more, well, more than welcome to be dismissed. But just go in an attitude of worship and go in an attitude of uh, asking God to use us in a mighty way, amen. You guys have a wonderful week. We will see you next week. Myself away. I give myself away so you can use me. I give myself away. I give myself away so you. Give myself away.